With today being the second Sunday of Lent, I invite us to hear again some more of Jesus' last words from the cross. Today we will hear him speak to one of the two thieves who hung on the crosses next to him. So let's listen as we hear his words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. I'm going to actually read verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said since you are under the same sentence? We are getting punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we sit again today at the foot of your cross, listening intently. We ask you to speak to the depths of our hearts so that we may hear, learn from, and put into practice what Jesus spoke so powerfully as he hung on that cross and died for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Pastor and author James Moore tells a story that comes out of World War II in which a young soldier asked a poignant question in the heat of battle. There was heavy shelling and bombardment going on that day on the front lines. And in the midst of it all, an American GI was stunned when another American soldier suddenly jumped into his foxhole with him. There they tried their best to keep down and avoid the enemy's fire. But after some time, the new occupant of the foxhole noticed something shiny in the dirt. He picked it up and saw that it was a cross. Quickly, he began to rub the dirt off from the front of the cross. And then he kept rubbing the cross. And finally, he turned to his newfound friend in the foxhole. And with complete seriousness, he said, how in the world do you make this thing work? Now, Moore concluded the story by saying, this young man was obviously confused, for we know that we don't make the cross work. The cross is not some electronic gadget that we turn on and off as needed. It is not some magic lamp that we rub on a whim to get our personal wishes granted. The cross is not some good luck charm. But Moore said, give that young soldier some credit. He didn't quite get it, but he did realize that there was some kind of power associated with the cross. Today, we continue our sermon series on Jesus' final words from the cross. The words that we hear Jesus say today are in response to one of the two thieves who hung on the cross next to him. And as I read the story about the soldiers, I thought about this, this thief because he was confused a little bit too. He knew why he was on the cross. He knew that he had done wrong. He knew that he had gotten caught and that he deserved his punishment. But he didn't quite understand this Jesus hanging next to him. He listened to the other thief hurling insults at Jesus, but rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? Even though the thief didn't understand what was happening to Jesus, he did, though, somehow sense that there was something about this cross there was something there that he needed. There was some power or some kind of love or forgiveness that he needed. And so he turns from the thief, the other thief, to Jesus, and he asks, well, really, almost pleads to Jesus to remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I found it interesting. This week I was at k and W. I'm here in a minute, Ron. And somebody, a friend of mine, stopped by to talk, and, and he had found lying on his table a little pamphlet. You know, we see those a lot. Pamphlets that explain the gospel to us. Pamphlets that are given out for evangelism. Well, guess what? This conversation between Jesus and the thief on the cross was brief, and there was no pamphlet. There was no plan of salvation read to him. No little card for the thief to fill out. No long sermon for him. Just Jesus hanging on the cross speaking 13 words to him. 13 words that changed his whole life. He said, I tell you the truth. 
today you will be with me in paradise. These words were really words of assurance to this dying thief. Now, his confession to Jesus wasn't a long list of what he had done wrong. In fact, he never once said anything that he'd done wrong. It was just a plea for Jesus to remember him. Now, in the Old Testament, we hear of times when God remembered someone, and each time that he did, it meant that God delivered them in some way. Let me give you some examples. In Genesis 8-1, God remembered Noah and saved him from the, from the flood. It said, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. In Genesis 19:29, God remembered Abraham and spared his nephew Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, so when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. In Genesis 30, 22, God remembered Rachel and opened her womb so that she could have a child. It says, then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and he opened her womb. And then in Exodus 2.24, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and therefore delivered the Israelites um, from slavery in Egypt. It says God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them and we know ultimately saved them from slavery. Over and over again, we see that when God remembered someone, it meant that he delivered them or saved them. And so for the thief to ask Jesus to remember him was really asking Jesus to deliver him and to save him. And that's exactly what Jesus did. I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You talk about words of assurance. Never were any truer and more pertinent words of assurance spoken than what Jesus said that day. Now, we could go so many different directions with these 13 words that Jesus spoke. We could talk about what Jesus really meant about paradise, or we could talk about what these words mean in terms of what will happen when we die. But I feel like in light of the world and where we are today, there really are two basic truths or lessons that I think come from these words that Jesus spoke. These are things that we learn about Jesus, about what he did and what he said, but they're also things that we need to learn about ourselves as followers of his. So let's look at them for a moment. First of all, the words that he spoke remind us that Jesus associated with sinners. Luke is the only gospel that records this conversation between Jesus and the thief on the cross. But that shouldn't surprise us. While all of the Gospels record the life and teachings of Jesus, they're a little different, aren't they? And that's because each Gospel writer had a purpose in mind. Matthew's purpose was to show the Jewish Christians that the prophecies of the Old Testament had been fulfilled in Jesus. John's Gospel was to show that the Holy Spirit was continuing to remind Jesus' followers of all that Jesus had said and taught even years after Jesus ascended back into heaven. But Luke... Luke, who was a Gentile, wanted to show everything from the standpoint of Jesus' concern for the least and the lost. And all through his gospel, Luke tells stories about Jesus hanging out with those that the rest of the world, especially the religious leaders, deemed unfit to be around. Adam Hamilton, in his book, Final Words from the Cross, puts it this way. He says, Jesus allowed the prostitute to wash his feet with her tears. He called tax collectors and garden variety sinners to be his disciples. He touched lepers. He spoke with the woman. He ate with unclean people. For Luke, there was no mistaking why Jesus had come to earth and what his primary purpose was. And he knew this from the people that Jesus hung out with. Not long before he died, we find Luke sharing the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. You remember his story? We all learned it as a kid, probably learned the little song, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, you know. Anyway, I learned it as a song in the Baptist church, maybe y'all did. Um, thank you. <laughs> all right, we learned about how this, this, this short and, and sinful tax collector had cheated so many people, and yet he was the very one that Jesus chose to go and have dinner with that night. <laughs> 
And oh, how this upset the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Luke says, all the people saw this and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Yes, he had. But because he went to have dinner with this sinner, Zacchaeus' life was changed forever. Listen to what Luke says. He says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times this amount. And Jesus heard what he said, and then he replied, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And then turning to the crowd, Jesus spoke these words that Luke feels, and I do too, were Jesus' primary mission statement. Hear it. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus came to save the lost. And the way that he did this was to associate with the lost, the least, the sinners. He didn't hang out with his close friends all the time. He didn't stay away from those places where sinners were usually found. No, he went to those places on purpose. He purposely sought out those who needed him the most. He associated with sinners. And what he did throughout his three years of ministry, he continued to do as he hung on the cross. And because of being present and willing to associate with sinners, many sinners came to know him as their Lord and Savior, just as Zacchaeus did and just as the thief on the cross did. So the question becomes, are we, are we willing to associate with sinners? Do we see our primary purpose here on earth as being the same as Jesus' was? Do we take seriously Jesus' commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all people? Hamilton shares a powerful story in his book that illustrates this point. There was a man in his church named Ron who was in law enforcement for 20 years. After he retired, people began to say to him, Ron, why don't you join our prison, church prison ministry? Ron's initial response was, you're kidding, right? I mean, I put these people there. You think I want to go and visit them? You want me to share Christ with them? I know what they're like. I'm not going there. But God kept working in Ron's heart. And so finally he began to volunteer with the church's prison ministry. And something happened. As he did, God began to fill his heart with compassion for the men that he visited. Even though he knew why they were there and what they were like, he began to reach out to them with love, compassion, kindness, and gentleness. And as he did they became became drawn to him. These young men began to look at him as a father figure. One example was a man named Mike. Mike entered a life of crime at a very early age. At first it was petty thief, just stealing candy from a store. But by the age of 16, he had stolen his first car. As he served time in prison, he tried to escape, and when they caught him, they put him in maximum security. And while he was there, surrounded by people who had done terrible crimes, He woke up one morning and realized that he had made a mess of his life. The question that kept coming back to him was, where do I go for hope? Finally, he came to the conclusion that he needed Jesus. And so he prayed. And guess what? Somebody introduced him to Ron, who became his friend and his mentor and his brother in Christ. Now, there's something you have to know. It makes this story even more remarkable. As a teenager, Mike had joined a white supremacist group. Ron, who showed Mike that love, was an African American. But today, Mike is born again and is a Christian brother, all because Ron was willing to associate with sinners just as Jesus did. Hamilton says, as Jesus lived, so he died. Even as he was crucified, Jesus was carrying out his mission statement and associating with sinners. And so we learn, first of all, that we must also carry out this mission. And that brings us to our second lesson. It's likely that we cannot carry out that mission, that we cannot even begin to associate with sinners as Jesus did until we realize the second thing that Jesus' words to that thief says to us. And that is that no one is beyond the grace of God. No one.
This thief probably thought that his luck had run out. He was about to die. He'd made a mess of his life. There was nothing he could do now. He was going to pay the penalty. But he didn't realize that God had a little different plan for him. And he didn't realize that God still loved him, even as he hung on the cross dying. Little did he know that hanging next to him was the very one who could save him, the very one who could take his punishment for him. Oh, yes, this thief went on to die. His body did. But his soul did not die. He would be with Jesus that day in paradise. And this was because no one, is beyond the grace of God, not even as they're taking their very last breath. We need to remember this. Because if we are to reach out to those in need of God's grace, then we must first remember how God reached out to us with his grace. Like I said last week, the mercy that we offer to others must flow out of the mercy that we receive from God. You see, we once were sinners too. We could have been that thief on the cross, folks. We were no different from him. We needed salvation. And Jesus extended that mercy and that grace to us. And so we must extend it to others. For no one is beyond the grace of God. I love the story about the man who showed up at church one day. And he was a lost soul. He'd been in so much trouble. But somehow he ended up in the church. He listened as the preacher shared the gospel the good news of the gospel. And as they sang the hymn of the response, he found himself almost pushed out into the aisle and walking down the aisle of the church. And when he got to where the pastor was, he said to him, do you think that there's any way that this message that you have preached today could possibly be for me? The preacher asked him what his name was. And then he said to him, oh, Jim, the grace of God that you heard here today is just for you. As Jesus lived, so he died. Associating with sinners because he knew that they were the very ones that he had come to earth for. And that includes us too. Where, where would we be today if Jesus hadn't associated with sinners like us? But he did. And so the good news is for us, and it's for everyone else too. As Jesus hung on the cross to make that salvation possible, he continu continued to show us what we are to do, to associate with sinners and to share the good news with them because no one is beyond the grace of God. And so as his followers today... I simply ask, will we live as Jesus lived and died? As we ponder all of this, I invite us to hear another monologue, this time coming from the thief hanging next to Jesus, as we allow ourselves to become even nearer to the cross. He looked at me with compassion. It had been a long time since I had felt anyone's compassion. My mother died when I was seven. My father was a drunkard whose idea of encouragement was to call me an idiot and to tell me to leave him alone. So I did. I began committing petty crimes when I was 10. I'd committed armed robbery when I was 15. And I killed a man before I was 20. I was a hopeless cause. And here I was, 46 years old, carrying my cross on the way to Calvary. It was amusing to me that Jesus of Nazareth was being crucified with us. I knew of him. Some among my friends had gone to hear him. Jesus had eaten with them. I knew some of the girls who had found religion by listening to him. They claimed he was God's Messiah. Strange Messiah, befriending sinners and prostitutes. If I believed in God, that's the kind of Messiah I would want. But I didn't, and so I was sure he wasn't. Yet I can tell you this. I could not take my eyes off of him. A huge crowd came out for his crucifixion. The money changers, the religious leaders, the Romans, and all those religious hypocrites. They stood around him, hurling insults at him. I joined in at first, 
Glad they weren't insulting me. But even I didn't have the stomach for it. It was then I heard him praying from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I was stunned. This friend of sinners praying for mercy for his enemies. Then he turned and looked at me as if he could see right through me. Even in my pain, I found myself drawn to this man. If, as some said, he was sent from God, and if God was like this man, showing mercy to sinners, then perhaps there was hope for me. My partner in crime, hanging on the third cross, began to hurl insults at Jesus once more. I shouted, Stop! Don't you see? We're getting what we deserve. He's done nothing wrong. And then... For some reason that I still don't understand, I turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And without hesitation, Jesus smiled at me through his own pain and replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And in that instant, I knew I was going to be all right. I now had hope. Let us consider now two questions in the silence of our hearts. Question one, am I willing to associate with sinners? Question two, do you want Jesus to remember you today and for what? Take a moment of silence to ponder these two questions.